week into a new eight-week series called Paul's Journeys. And um, the eight weeks is going to cover nine years worth of material. So we're going to be moving along. There are going to be some things that I don't say because obviously with eight weeks it's hard to cover nine years. But I hope as you track with me that you'll be reading in the book of Acts, that you will join me with Paul on his journeys. And as you learn about him and about, about the significance of some of the conversations and experience and actions that he has, that you will also understand that his journey is your journey. And last week what I did was I gave you a basic introduction about who Saul or Paul was. Because sometimes in our minds we have a picture, we have an idea about who we think he is. And what I wanted you to see is that he's very real. His resume is impressive, but in his character and in his nature, he's a lot like you and I. And so as we move forward today, we're going to move and begin with him on his first missionary journey, which took about two years. He traveled about 1,400 miles, and it took him about two years. And so if you will, join me uh, in that journey as we're getting started in the book of Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. The question I left you with last week was this. What if God were going to call you in a different direction than the one you had been heading in? What if God were trying to get your attention to redirect you in a new direction? Could you hear Him? And if you did, would you resist or would you be open the new way in which he would be leading you, especially if it were to cost you a great deal. Saul was headed in a certain direction with his life. He had given all of his energy and passion and commitment to knowing God and pursuing him in the way that he thought was right until one day he was arrested on the road to Damascus when he was going to seize and to imprison and to even kill those who were followers of the way, he was arrested by the risen Jesus, and he was stopped in his tracks. He was blinded for a period of three days and three nights. Eventually, as God sent him someone to pray over, the scales from his eyes fell, and he realized that his life was going to be entirely different than it had been all and up to that point. His life was going to take a dramatic new turn. He had no idea of what was ahead of him. And probably if he did, I don't know if he would have signed up for it. Much like you and I. You and I have no idea what's ahead. The only thing that we can ask ourselves is, are we willing to travel with the one who has created us for great purpose? And are we open to the possibility of traveling in a way that is different from the one that we have been traveling? even if it means sacrifice and pain and discomfort. And I want you to think about that as we move, because in Acts chapter 11, what we're going to get is the scattering of the early believers. The reason that the believers left Jerusalem primarily was because they were being persecuted. And so once the persecution began, they scattered and moved different places. And I want to just read a little background before we get to our central text. So in Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19, it says the following. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. Now, when you're, when you're looking at this map here, and I just want you a lot of times when you're reading the scriptures and you get like the names of places, you just skim past those, don't you? You don't even think about those, okay? Because that's not the meaty stuff. But if what we're going to cover here, we're going to have a context and an understanding for, what I need you to understand is that Jerusalem would not be on this map. It would be somewhere around here, if the map were to extend. Now, when we're going up the coast, we would hit Lebanon, which is really Phoenicia. It's probably right about somewhere in here. Okay, so Phoenicia is here. 
As we're making our way up, you see Cyprus, which is mentioned, and then Antioch, which is Turkey. Okay? So just to give you a frame of reference for the distance that is being covered, Phoenicia is about 185 miles to the north. Cyprus is about 250. And Antioch is about 300 miles. So what you have is believers who were scattered 150, 220, 300 miles. They're being scattered up and away, okay? Now, this is bad and it's good. It's bad because they're in fear for their lives. It's good because wherever they resettle, the gospel is going to go. So people who were ignorant of Jesus and his message will now be learned. <coughs> So as we're getting started, I just want you to know the gospel is going to spread up, okay? Now, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. And the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. You just stop for just a second. What I didn't say is it's been about 15 years. It's 46 AD. It's been 15 years since Christ was crucified. Okay? So there's been the passage of time. The gospel is now just going out to the Gentiles. It happened in smatterings, but not in large numbers. And when you get to Antioch, this is the church in Turkey where the believers were first called Christians. And the most amazing thing that's going on in Antioch is that for the very first time, Jews and Gentiles alike are forming the church. It's the first time in 15 years. So this is a departure for the early community of faith. It's an exciting thing. People who are outside the Jewish culture are now being converted to the Christian message. Okay? We continue. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, that Gentiles were coming to faith, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. I just want to say, I am so glad that they sent Barnabas. They could have sent some other guys who would have been jealous of the Gentiles, who would have tried to stop the Gentiles from receiving the good news. But Barnabas, the scriptures say, who was a good man and full of the Spirit, went and was encouraged, and he encouraged them. The passage continues, verse 29, 23. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. So get the picture of what has happened here. Barnabas is sent from Jerusalem to check out what is going on in Antioch. The church at Antioch is thriving with both Jew and Gentile believers. This is new. When Barnabas gets there, he realizes that he needs someone else who's going to understand and can contribute to this ministry in a new and fresh way. Who does he choose? He chooses Saul of Tarsus. Now Saul had been away for three years. He went to Arabia. He kind of falls off the map. We don't know what went on during this period, but he is being instructed and prepared, much like Moses was on the backside of the desert in Midian. Saul goes away for a period of time and he is being developed. And Barnabas says, hey, I remember that Saul, who understood the Jewish law as good as anybody, but also was raised in a Gentile city, might have some idea how to cross these two cultures. So I'm going to go get Saul going to help me. And when he did, he brought him back, and for a year, they preached to this group, they strengthened this group, they encouraged this group, and now the group, one day, is going to send them off on what will become the very first missionary journey. Now, all of that is backdrop, but you need to understand that if you're going to understand what happens moving forward, okay? 
If you don't know the context, it's very difficult to understand the development of the details that's about to come. We'll skip to verse uh, chapter 13. Now in chapter 13, right in the beginning, you're going to get some, a few details that you need to pay attention to. When you're reading the scriptures, you can't just speed read. There are a few things there that are important for you to know. Understand, chapter 13 and chapter 14 are the first missionary journey. They take two years. They take you about 15 minutes. So two years and 15 minutes. Maybe you could read them a little more slowly because there's a lot there that can be taken in <coughs> if we're not just trying to complete the book. Okay. Chapter 13. Among the prophets and the teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, <coughs> Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manan, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. And one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. What stood out as you listened to those first few verses to you at all? Anything dramatic? Anything extreme? Is there anything that stood out to you? Great diversity of these people. Okay. Some of these people are coming from as far as Africa. Cyrene is Libya. That's 785 miles away. Okay. There is diversity. It says, it says as you read, Simeon called the black man. So we know there is into a new culture a mixed race of people who are a part of this new Jewish <clears throat> Gentile church. People who've come as far as Africa. The gospel has spread over the course of the 15 years. How it got there, we're not exactly sure. But there are believers from literally now all over the world. Now there's one other person that is mentioned there. Did you catch one of the last people mentioned who's a part of the leading group? Yes. Manea, the childhood friend of Herod Antipas. Do we know who Herod Antipas is? He's son of Herod the Great. He was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. And he was the one who was ruling at the time that Jesus was crucified. So we have a friend of his from childhood who was a part of this church. Isn't that interesting? Like, I wondered if you traced their lives, how you could have traced one going in one direction and one going in such an opposite direction. That happens, doesn't it? Over time, we make choices, we make decisions, and it leads us places. Manan was led to a certain place, and Herod was led to a certain other place. Rock. Yeah, and I noticed in that passage that it was uh, several of the people who were out in person. Yeah. There was lots of people who were converted from being on one side, then to the <laughs> then to the other. No question. Okay. So one day they're fasting and they're praying, and the Holy Spirit speaks to this leadership group. And the Holy Spirit says, I want you to send out, I want you to commission and send out Barnabas. Seems like a good choice. He's a great guy. Everybody likes him. And Saul. What a turnaround story he is. Be stunned and amazed at who God uses for his purposes in the world. Be stunned and amazed. And understand, if there's hope for someone like him, then maybe there's hope for someone like you. Be stunned and amazed at Saul of Tarsus being one of two, being one of three, beyond the very first missionary journey. It's incredible. So, Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit, and they went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and then they sailed to the island of Cyprus. There, in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues, and they preached the word of God, and John Mark went with them as their assistant. Okay. So, what's important about this? Cyprus is actually on the map here. Okay, so they're going from here... 
And their first stop from Solution, the seaport town, is to go to Salins. Okay. Now, the part we're going to focus in on is going to ultimately happen here in Capos. But when they arrive at Salins, um, they begin by going to the synagogue. Now, why would they go to the synagogue when they arrived at the island of Cyprus? Does anybody have any idea? It's the first thing they did. They weren't on a street corner. They weren't in the town, not in the marketplace, the Agora. They didn't go to a stadium, which would have been there as well. All of the major towns and cities had all of these things. They went to the synagogue. And the reason that they went to the synagogue was because there were a group of people who would have been familiar with the scriptures. And that's where they were going to start. Because Saul was going to tell his amazing story. He was going to share his testimony about how he was a persecutor of believers. He was going to tell the story of Jesus Christ to people who were familiar with the scriptures. So that like he, because he knew the scriptures well, but he was blinded. He was blinded to the fact that God had been preparing to send his son Jesus Christ for years and years and years and years, and he was going to introduce them to the prophets and their teachings. He was going to share with them things that they needed to know so that their eyes could be opened. They first went to the synagogue, and they did this in every town they lived in, if there was a synagogue. This will become a common practice for them. So when they get to Cyprus, they travel across the island, stopping in every town and every synagogue, preaching the good news, the message, every Saturday, okay? Now, does anybody have any idea how far it is from one side of Cyprus to the other side of Cyprus? If you do, this will be great. It could be a super genius for which I'm judging. <laughs> anybody have any guess? I mean, look at the odds. It's about 150 miles. Craig Nutter said that. It's about 150 miles to Do you want to come finish the rest? <laughs> about 150 miles, so they're walking 150 miles from Salamis to Bay folks. Anybody done that recently? <laughs> Making the good news of the gospel 150 miles walking? It's pretty incredible. It also mentions that they have a young companion with them by the name of John Mark. John Mark's going to become very interesting <laughs> next week to us. But for now, what do we know about John Mark? We know that he was a companion of Peter. We know that he was with Jesus in the earliest days. He basically was a he, he was a, a walking encyclopedia of knowledge about who Jesus was. We know that he wrote the Gospel of Mark. This guy traveled with, journeyed with Jesus. He knew him well. He saw the miracles. He heard the teachings. He rubbed shoulders with him. It's a good guy to have with you on a missionary journey, isn't it? Because if Saul runs to, into any problems, because some of it's probably a little fuzzy for Saul, he can turn to John Mark and say, hey, John Mark, here's maybe where you can step in and fill in the blanks here. It's a good person to have. So there's three of them, and they're traveling from town to town to town. Cyprus is the first. Now, Cyprus is about 100 miles from Antioch, but it's 150 miles across, and they're going to walk across sharing the gospel. We really are getting to the place where I'm going to make some practical application. But this is really important for you to know. Okay, verse 4, uh, verse 6. So they arrive, they're there. Afterwards, they travel from town to town across the entire island until finally they reach Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul had said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Of all the conversations that happened here on the island of Cyprus, this is the only one that is recorded. It's as if Luke says, of everything else, this is the most significant conversation. Pay attention to this one. Paphos is the capital of Cyprus. Sergius Paulus 
is the governor. He's the voice of Rome. Rome controls Cyprus at this point. He is the power broker on the island. He's a significant figure. And he has heard, as they have made their way across Cyprus, about the gospel, about Saul, about Barnabas, and he's interested. He's intrigued. He wants to know more. So he <laughs> sends for them. And as they're making their way to him, they arrive in his court. And they are going to share with him what they have shared with everyone else. With ears and heart open, he is ready to respond, but he has a problem. He has another voice in his ear telling him not to listen. Telling him this is just a bunch of garbage. Don't pay any attention to them. It's like bar Jesus versus Jesus. Right? Who's going to win? And as they're standing there, this guy, I would imagine, is incredibly annoying. Because Saul and Barnabas are there. He has sent for them. The governor's there. They're starting to preach and teach. And he's over there like, shut up, shut up. They don't matter. Don't, don't listen to them. What a waste of time. Don't, don't listen to them. And I would imagine that as these voices are both competing for the attention of the governor, that it's difficult for him to hear. You know, we live in a world of competing voices. Do you know that if you set in your heart to do the right thing and to honor God with your life and to follow His teaching, that you will run up against competing voices in an almost constant fashion? It's true. So, so here's where you need to dial down in. This is Paul's story, it's your story. We live in a world of competing voices. For some of us, it's the voice of hurt. The voice of hurt has been speaking to us for a very long time. We say, that voice says, if God really loved me, then why would he let this happen? If God really cared about my life, why would I be in this place? If God, then why? It's the voice of hurt. It's the voice of broken dreams. It's the voice of unmet expectation. But it plays loudly in our heads, some of us. It's competing for our heart. It's a competing voice, but it's not the only one. There's the competing voice of fear that plays loudly in some of our heads. That voice of fear, when we acknowledge what is before us and the possibility, causes us, as we look at it and dream about it and hope for it, not to go for it, not to take big risks, not to take chances, but to play it safe and to live status quo and to never move beyond where we are because we're afraid, afraid of a million different things, but nevertheless afraid. The voice of fear competes for our life with God. And it causes us to not extend ourselves in any way towards faith. It's a competing voice. Sometimes it's the voice of the pillow. The pillow which just says, oh, just five more minutes. Just, just five more minutes. Five more minutes becomes ten more minutes, becomes twenty more minutes. And then that time that you were going to carve out in the morning to spend quietly with God is gone. It's time to go to work. It's that voice that speaks to us about the need not to have any discipline in our lives. <coughs> and it speaks loudly. And what I have learned along the way in my own walk is that God will do amazing things in and with and through our lives, but there is some real part for us to play. There is a place for discipline in the life of faith. You don't just drift into God's greatness for your life. You don't just stumble into it. There is a part of participation. And sometimes that voice of the pillow, which says just five more minutes, just five more minutes, it can distract us from God's best for our lives. There's so many other voices, but how about the voice of judgment? The one that declares we're just losers, and we always will be. That we've screwed this one up again. How could we possibly ever get anywhere? Our lives just seem to be one consistent screw-up after another. It's the voice of judgment. 
declare that you have no value, no worth, no purpose, why try? There's lots of voices. And those voices are competing for your heart, for your soul. I wonder this morning, as you think about Sergius Paulus and his interaction now with Saul and Barnabas and Bar Jesus, I wonder if you can't imagine and understand how difficult it must have been for this man to hear and respond to the good news. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're equally troubled at responding to the good news in an ongoing way. Sure, there was once upon a time when you said, yes, I will take that, I will embrace that, I desire that, I want that. But how many times along the way in your Christian journey have you been sidetracked because of other voices playing so loudly in your head? It's competing voices. We live in a world of competing voices. The question really becomes, which voice are we going to listen to? Which voice is going to have its way in us? I, I want to say this, and I want you to get this, because I think... Um, this is really sort of the crux of the matter. When we look at it and we listen to it and we think about Sergius Paulus, we need to understand this. The voices that we listen to will ultimately determine the direction of our journey and the quality of our life. get nothing else from this, you need to hear that. We live in a world of competing voices. The voices that we listen to will determine the direction of our journey and the quality of it all the way. Let's finish the story. Though. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he looked at the sorcerer in the eye, and then he said, he's never really been one on new ones. You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Can you imagine this show down here? The guy's trying to distract. He's trying to, to create such chaos that the governor doesn't, doesn't respond. Because if the governor responds, it's going to mean problems for him. He's a sorcerer. And he's in the governor's entourage. He's no longer going to have a place in the governor's entourage if the governor believes what Saul and Barnabas are teaching. He's going to be out of a job. He's going to be out of a, a, a place of status. He's going to be nobody. He can't let that happen. So amidst all of his yelling and screaming, Paul just looks directly at him and calls him what I just told you he called him. He tells him what I just told you he tells him. You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. And instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. So, let's get this straight. Jesus walks from town to town, opening the eyes of the blind. Saul walks from town to town, closing them. <laughs> but does this sound a little familiar? Is Bar Jesus' story not Saul's story? Is it possible that he is blinded and that his being blinded is actually a vehicle of grace to this man? It was to Saul. Saul's life changed forever after his eyes were opened. What if for this man, this moment, was a life-changing one? We look at this and it seems super harsh. He's like, stop bothering me, you nutcase. And then he, he's like, he's blind. 
<laughs> right? He's like, oh, I can't see. He's like, pushes it to the side, and they finish the discussion, right? But what if, like Saul, this is exactly what this guy needed in order to be open to a change in direction? What if he wasn't going to lose his job as a part of the entourage of the government? What if he was just going to change his job title? There's something really powerful going on here in the most powerful seat on the entire island. Sergius Paulus is the governor. He's the head honcho. He's the chief of the area. Listen to what happens to him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. It ultimately results in conversion. Now, I don't know what ends up happening there on Cyprus because this is going to be their first stop on the journey. Now, they'll travel back and they'll come back, but for now, this part of the leg of their journey is done. Where once Sergius Paulus was blind, now he can see. Where once Saul was blind, he now can see. Bar Jesus, we never read anything else about. Him. So we live in the question, I wonder what happened to him. And while we wonder what happened to him, I wonder what will happen to you. Because you and I live in a world of competing voices. And we get to choose which voice is going to lead us. And some of us, while we claim the name of Christ, have been led by fear for the better part of our Christian journey. And some of us, though we claim the name of Christ, have been led by judgment for the better part of our Christian journey. And some of us, for the better part of our Christian journey, have been self-absorbed. And some of us, for the better part of our Christian journey, have been lazy. And some of us, for the better part of our journey, have lived under judgment. And I just want to say to you, those voices, the wind of those spirits, are not the same as the Holy Spirit, who guides and leads and heals and restores and calls you for greater things. And I wonder which voice you're going to listen to. Because the voice you listen to will determine the direction of your journey and the quality of your life. And I want to say this morning, may God give you the grace to silence the competing voices, to distinguish the difference between the Holy Spirit's voice and the voice of those that bring judgment and shame and condemnation and fear. Because those are not God. And they will never lead you to the place He desires you to go. But you and I get to choose. And that's why as we travel with Paul, we can be excited about what we learn from him. Because there's one conversation that happens on the island of Cyprus so many years ago that still speaks to you and me about a very real issue that goes on from day to day. And if we will learn from this conversation, it will serve us well as we continue the rest of the journey. We live in a world of competing voices. Make sure the one that you're listening to is the one that's from God. Because the other ones have a great capacity to lead you to death and not life. And God wants to lead you to life and life and life. Amen. So, Lord, we are off now. We have set sail with Saul and Barnabas and Mark. And as we move through your scriptures, your word to us, may we learn what is most significant about where we are right now and what we most need to hear on our own journeys. Teach us. Lead us. That your voice may be the strongest one guiding and directing our paths. And as you do, give us the courage to turn around if we need to, to chart a new course, to 
change direction if the direction we've been heading in is one that has been leading us away from you and towards life. Give us the courage and the to make those choices in